Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international bestseller called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And our guest today is Dr. Robert Davis, who is an internationally recognized scientist and served as a professor at the State University of New York for over 30 years. He published over 60 articles in scholarly journals, lectured at national and international scientific conferences, and was awarded several major research grants. Dr. Davis serves as a member of the Board of Directors and Research Team of the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Foundation for Research into Extraterrestrial and Extraordinary Experiences, which was established to provide a scientific exploration of the relationship among science, consciousness, and extraordinary experiences. He has written two great books, one entitled The UFO Phenomena, Should I Believe?, and the other, Life After Death, an Analysis of the Evidence. Today we'll be speaking about the analysis of evidence of the afterlife, but I encourage you to visit his website, which is theufophenomena.com. Find out more about his interesting work. Dr. Robert Davis, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Uh, Sandra, it's an absolute pleasure to be a guest on your show. I'm a big fan. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I'm delighted that we were able to meet up today. And thank you for sending me the copy of your book. Oh, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, it, you've really done some research. And if we could start, well, maybe introduce you uh, yourself a little bit and maybe some of your background that um, yeah, tells a little bigger picture of who you are besides what I just introduced. Sure. Um, I've uh, yeah, yeah. Always been interested in consciousness, and, and it comes with the territory being a, a sensory neuroscientist. Uh, and you can't help but wonder whether or not consciousness, which is a term to be used instead of soul or spirit, uh, persists at the bodily death. And that is the question that millions throughout history have tried to explore. Uh, many, of course, have a faith-based belief in a form of consciousness or sense of reality, despite the hard drive crashing and the screen you know, fading to black. Uh, but the only thing I could say with uh, absolute certainty to the 150,000 individuals who are going to die every day is that the body, of course, is going to decay in the ground or the remains will be in a jar and on a mantelpiece. Uh, the obvious overarching issue, which I've always wondered along with everybody else at one point in time or another, is whether or not there is an afterlife, whatever that means. And we don't have the adequate terms to actually describe what we may even be talking about. But we see evidence, and I can't help but not apply my so-called left brain analytical mind to trying to connect the dots across many different experiments uh, in the laboratory setting on non-local intuitive perception, or ESP, Uh, anecdotal information from individuals who have out-of-body and native experiences, Uh, even individuals, believe it or not, who report to interact with non-human intelligences of varying types uh, throughout history, depicted in folklore, religious texts as fairies, goblins, angels, uh, and more modern-day accounts of greys, reptilians, etc. So what what are we talking about here? We're talking about, is there an afterlife? Yes, that's the overarching issue, I think. Yes. But, we, but we're also looking at evidence in multitude of different ways, scientifically derived and non-scientifically obtained through anecdotal evidence of people who report experiencing that so-called other side, whatever that is. And all I can say with certainty is that it's real in their minds. And thus, you know, philosophically speaking, I guess you can say it's real. But science doesn't want uh, that as the basis for objective evidence to determine whether or not there is an afterlife, despite the fact that 200,000 uh, Americans alone report to have an NDE. Uh, extrapolate that to numbers worldwide and throughout time. We're talking certainly about millions of people who once resuscitated from after flatlining, so to speak, uh, in terms of their EEG, are resuscitated to recount very similar types of experiences that, of course, defy logical explanation. And I'm sure almost all, if not all of your listeners, are very familiar with the the typical NDE 
uh, narrative. Um, so we're not going to go into great detail about that, but but the point is that individuals report a, 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 a altered sense of consciousness and uh, altered perception that is of of reality, which they believe is real and is, which is distinctly different than that prior to this NDE-like experience or OBE-like experience where they see or experience no time or space, view their environment in a 360 degree fashion, sense unconditional, profound love that cannot be captured in words alone. Although one woman uh, who I quote in my book said that the, the unconditional love she felt during her NDE was was like looking in your newborn baby's eyes for the first time magnified 10 million times. Beautiful. Now that, that, that that's getting at it. We hear different depictions of that magnitude of love that people experience. The obvious question is why? Why love? The studies have shown that that love is a predominant char- emotional characteristic that is sensed during this experience. Why love? And why is it so similar um, in terms of perceptual outcomes, in terms of emotional uh, feelings that ultimately and very interestingly transforms individuals, as you and your audience likely know, uh, in generally a very positive way from that experience forward. Uh, and we see this positive behavioral transformative change, not only in individuals who have an NDE, but also in individuals who have a wide range of spiritual, mystical, and extraordinary experiences, which include, again, interactions with non-human intelligences, shamanic journeys, mystical meditation, uh, even in lucid dreams, the ingestion of psychedelic drugs like ayahuasca, which I do not advocate uh, <laughs> for, of right. course. But there are unique similarities uh, from an emotional and perceptual perspective, um, despite the the dissimilarity of these kinds of experiences, which evoke uh, more questions than answers. One is whether or not it is just a pure brain-based event that can be written away uh, to neurophysiological changes resulting from whatever experience is giving rise to it, like a dy- uh, dying uh, chaotic brain that may, may be producing illusory types of perceptions in, in one who's having an NDE. Uh, there are obvious different perspectives on what is going on here, but there are so many different things that are going on and, and defining, understanding what these quote unquote things are. What people are truly experiencing, reporting, what researchers are finding in laboratories regarding ESP, etc., as well as theories in quantum physics. All these dots, all these pieces of information must be uh, interconnected, analyzed in an overarching fashion using agreed upon hypotheses and experimental paradigms, if at all possible, to understand the complexity of this wide range of perceptual, physiological, psychological, even paranormal life experiences that mm-hmm. people are reporting. Complexity is a understatement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, some of these NDEs we hear about, and there's been many guests that I've had on this show with their stories, but they've had the extra sensory perception, they've been able to see into things they couldn't possibly have seen while their body's lying on a table somewhere. Well, the, and that refers to the term veridical perception. It's, it's a rare event, but it's, uh, <clears throat> it's the home run in terms of NDE researchers who quest for verifying just what you said, uh, one's ability to accurately perceive events remote from the body while they are experiencing an NDE. And according to some researchers, there is some evidence that does um, provide a, a case for veridical perceptions that defy explanation. Now, it is rare, but you, you look at a few cases and all we need is one case to substantiate that it is indeed valid. Meaning yes. what? What does that mean? It means what? An aspect of one's uh, Uh, consciousness or body in the form of an energy yet to be detected like uh, shall we call it the torsion energy that some quantum physicists physicists are now exploring 
uh, does a form of energy, in other words, that may possibly represent an aspect of consciousness generated by neurons in the brain where quantum processes have been discovered, where biophotons or ultra weak, shall we call it, uh, emissions are generated by the brain that give rise to a form of energy yet to be yet to be validated by the scientific community known as a torsion wave. And if there is any degree of hope that there is an afterlife, uh, we would like to see some objective evidence that will reinforce the subjective anecdotal accounts of this other reality upon, you know, being near death as millions contend to uh, experience. So uh, science wants that quantifiable, objective, measurable uh, aspect of energy that may, again, be generated by the body that might, in other words, persist after the body dies. And, and while millions don't need that confirmation because they've experienced in varying ways that so-called other side or having an afterlife or recall of past lives or whatever shape or size so to speak or type that it comes that it comes uh, to the forefront in one's mind uh, uh, science still needs to uh, objectively evaluate whether or not there is indeed this possibly unknown fifth fundamental force of energy like a torsion energy that will possibly be the so-called missing link in Einstein's unified field theory with comprised of the two nuclear forces electromagnetic and um, uh, uh, electromagnetic and uh, magnetism so eventually maybe someday that unified field theory will incorporate an aspect of consciousness. And wow, if realized, if validated, I'm not, and I'm not saying uh, it, there is an afterlife. I'm not saying that consciousness persists at the bodily death. I'm saying that there is uh, there's strong uh, suggestive evidence that research must researchers must uh, focus on much more extensively. Uh, from using a multidisciplinary research approach to connect the dots that I'm addressing here to better understand uh, what consciousness is. And we don't even know how to define it, what criteria comprise consciousness, uh, the, despite the fact that you know, there's been this endless stream of papers written on consciousness, but we have different perspectives. Um, of that concept based on whether or not one comes from a, a medical profession or a phil philosopher, uh, etc. We, we have completely different takes on what that is. So studying it is an enigma in and of itself, uh, since we don't know what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't, we don't even know how to experimentally, experimentally, uh, uh, test it because the, these NDEs or OBEs, uh, uh, among other extraordinary experiences, occur spontaneously. So you can't get a pre versus post comparative analysis yes. uh, of of the effect on the behavioral or psychosocial, um, so I should say, psycho spiritual um, perspectives that individuals claim to be changed, facilitated, in other words, by that extraordinary event. Um, look, if, 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 if tonight I happen to have an NDE, which I don't, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not <laughs> a willing participant. Correct. Yeah. Um, how do you think, uh, anyone would feel, you know, the next morning while eating their cereal? I mean, things are going to be different. The same can be said for, for individuals who claim to interact with non-human intelligences that may or may not be associated with a, that so-called UFO. Uh, or, <clears throat> or have uh, again recall of, of past lives or experienced an altered reality via psychedelic drugs. The, the, the details of research experiments are too numerous for us to capture in, in a, a very short hour. Uh, my book, obviously, if I may plug it again, sure. Life After Death and Analysis of the Evidence, uh, was an attempt to try to connect the dots. Look at look at mediumship. Look yes. at apparitions, reincarnation, quantum physics, the brain consciousness connection, near death and out of body experiences, etc. And it, 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 my extensive research 
incorporating both scientific, anecdotal uh, evidence, among others, attempts to try to capture the essence of a phenomenon that we all yearn for. Yes. And those who experience an afterlife uh, advocate with fierce determination what is going on. They no longer fear death. They become more humane, mm -hmm. more spiritual, less interested in organized religion, less materialistic, more empathetic. A key, a key emotion that we see in, in research uh, across all of these spiritual, mystical, and extraordinary experiences, more empathetic towards others, more sympathetic, compassionate, more humane overall in many different ways. In other words, their, their philosophical and personal attributes are shifted. There's a paradigm shift from that day forward. And a clear characteristic of such changes incorporates, again, as you and your listeners know, uh, uh, of the fact that these individuals no longer fear death. I have a neighbor here who, who had an NDE many years ago, and she says, the one thing I could say with certainty is that I experience an afterlife and I no longer fear death. And believe it or not, two days ago, two of my neighbors, close neighbors, saw a UFO. Uh, you know, a single uh, silver that is triangular shaped uh, object with circular lights on the bottom of it, flew over their houses, became stationary and suddenly winked out. OK, so I have two neighbors right here. One had an NDE. Both saw and um, one of them saw two UFOs. This one included the other one. So the point <laughs> the point is the frequency of such events are staggering. Uh, and and. And, and the fact that so many individuals are having these kinds of extraordinary experiences in all different ways uh, should at least, at the very least, alert the psychological community to the high incidence of such occurrences because these individuals are shaken to their core, generally in a positive way, but not always. They are obviously left with anxiety, confusion. What happened to me? What did I just experience? Uh, re realistic. Uh, understandable questions that that they are reluctant, understandably, to share with many people and, uh, for fear of ridicule, obviously. Sure. Can I share uh, a, a short yeah. story with you? Of course. My father was an airline pilot and very analytical. And he came home, and I remember this so clearly when I was in high school, and he was a captain for American Airlines. He and his whole flight crew – uh, that were in the cockpit, they saw, nothing was on the radar, but they saw uh, what appeared to be like a UFO type thing filled with lights just hover close to them in the cockpit. It was dark. They saw it. They all saw the same thing. And then uh, nothing on the radar screen just hovered there close to them. And then within seconds, just disappeared. And I remember, because I'm thinking, Dad's not crazy, and everybody saw it. And then, you know, now being a 50, going on 52-year-old woman, knowing the vastness of the universe, I mean, I don't know how vast it is because it's pretty darn vast, uh, and the billions of planets and solar systems and all that out there. Um, you know, it's interesting. I want to ask you, our, our brains, our minds, I think a lot of us want to, I don't know if we want to be skeptical or if we have a fear of what would people think if we believe in these kind of things. But why is it so hard for many people to even be open to having these kind of conversations when there's so many things, like, say, the vastness of the universe, that it, it, it just boggles the mind? So why would people say, well, it's impossible for there to be aliens? It would be possible, impossible to have uh, life on another planet. Why do we, as a whole, many people, be so skeptical on that, even life after death? Yeah, it's a curiosity. I, I scratch my head all the time trying to figure out just that. Why, why is it not a much more uh, openly discussed um, uh, uh, concern that's taken much more seriously by the public at large, as, especially the scientific community? Um, is it an aspect of one's ego that, that 
mitigates their this desire to explore this arena in greater detail, read more about it, listen to shows, uh, excellent shows like yours, for instance, that, that address matters that are of fundamental importance that might provide unique perspectives about what consciousness is, am I the body, uh, uh, not only is there an afterlife, but what is reality? Uh, and and I guess ever since we evolved and began crawling out of that so-called primordial soup and developed into what, the uh, complex language-based bipedal primates that we are today, we've always wondered about um, the mysterious. The, why are we so curious about what is the nature of our reality? Not only what is that light traveling in the sky uh, thousands of years ago, which now we know is a meteor or a comet. Yeah. Um, but today, yeah, the, the experience that people are having with UFOs, uh, uh, as you just mentioned, are too numerous to ignore. It, 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 we can go on and on about unique experiences, mass sightings uh, of these. But what's more important than that is that people are, again, contending that that non-human intelligences are associated with these UFOs. And when people interact with it, they have extraordinary experiences like altered space and time. Which, again, behavioral transformative um, outcomes that are generally positive in nature and are analogous, similar to the other types of extraordinary experiences we, we have uh, briefly mentioned. And how do we make sense of that all? I can't figure out why uh, the media, other than in certain movies, uh, these concerns are depicted. And when they are depicted in, in movies like UFOs, uh, it's, it's often associated with a negative theme. But that's not the case in the research uh, that I am very familiar with, uh, and which is, of course, addressed in my book. But what's the overarching issue at hand? Yeah. Yeah, is there an afterlife? What does that mean? We don't know. Uh, other than what people say, which is, yeah, I, I experienced a heavenly realm. With vivid colors, a beautiful landscape, uh, unconditional feelings of unconditional love, a oneness and interconnectedness with the universe. I, I can go anywhere at will. I see 360 degrees. I'm more compassionate, more humane. What is going on here? It's a simple question. I wish I had a, a, a clear answer. But people are transformed by these yes. experiences, and that leads me to more than scratch my head, but we're just scratching the surface in terms sure of understanding are. what's going on. Transformation being the word. Every person I've spoken with thus far on the show that's had one of these extraordinary experiences, not just near-death experiences, but so many of the other things, they are literally transformed. They have a whole new view of life. Many of them turn to being a person of service, helping others. Uh, they're not sweating the small stuff. They're not afraid of death. It's really fantastic. Even myself, I haven't had a near-death experiences, but I've done a lot of discovery and journeys. I remember a weekend course I took with uh, physicist Russell Targ on remote viewing, just as one of those mm. things. And to be able to see images that were in an envelope that I has not yet been opened, to, um, yeah, I mean, so to see things halfway around the world, even though I'm sitting at that time in Rhinebeck, New York, how in the world would my consciousness be able to pick up that if I am just this flesh and bones sitting in this body here. I mean, it just opens my eyes to there's more to life than meets the eye, and there's more to each one of us than we know. Oh, indeed. Uh, perfectly stated, Sandra. Um, uh, that, that is the, the ultimate issue at hand here. And yes, there are extensive studies done in well-controlled laboratory settings that do prove, at least in my mind, just what you said. You know, ESP, in other words, is real. Remote viewing or non-locality, meaning the ability to perceive events remote from the body with great accuracy, as people have out-of-body experiences can tend to do, as people sitting you know, right here and now, so to speak, can perceive events you know, beyond their so-called physical capabilities. This has been shown. Uh, we see this at the subatomics level as well. 
Uh, and again, we don't have time to go into great uh, detail about it, but, but we do know that subatomic particles behave in such a bizarre manner. But since we are composed of subatomic particles, just like the entire vast infinite universe is, maybe, maybe we can extrapolate from such ex bizarre behavior at that level to what we might be capable of experiencing now in the form of ESP or the perception of alternate realms. Look, uh, Nobel Prize recipients uh, Eugene Wigner uh, and Erwin Schrodinger, who even worked with Einstein, believed that ESP could be explained by, by realizing that our consciousness, whatever that is, let's call it I, spirit, soul, is immersed in, in uh, if, I'm, if I remember the quote exactly, it's immersed in the uh, quantum mechanic wave function, which they considered serves as a field of consciousness over the Earth. Now, these are Nobel Prize recipients. Yes. They're talking about a field of consciousness over the Earth, quote unquote. They talk about cosmic consciousness, quote unquote. What are they talking about? And then... And then uh, we have people who have an NDE and they're reluctant to share their experience with another. Uh, yet in the literature, if people do some homework, they, they will very easily realize that experiments in ESP prove non-locality is valid. In my mind, I can say that with certainty. Uh, and that alone may be the basis represent represent a form of energy, a bioenergy that might be uh, a yet to be discovered energy that might facilitate a uh, continuation of consciousness at the bodily death. Or in other words, it'll prove the so-called so survival hypothesis, possibly, possibly, and become part again of Einstein's unified field theory. But when these leading scientists worldwide uh, recognize, uh, talk about fields of consciousness. Um, well, that sounds more bizarre than, you know, I had an NDE or I saw a UFO or just as bizarre. <laughs> so the point yes, is, yes. You, know, you know, even things that Einstein said, Newton said, Nicholas Tesla said, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, Mikhail Kaku, we, the, the long list of, of noted physicists, scientists, etc., who contend that there's a multiverse, alternate dimensions that coexist with ours in the same time and space, but at a different frequency, that allow possibly uh, uh, beings from these other dimensions to, to appear in our reality. Uh, well, is that, if true, and in their minds, these exquisite, sophisticated mathematical formulas that give rise to these multiverse-like uh, theories which incorporate aspects of other realities or dimensions, if if that's true, if that's true, then maybe, maybe that provides uh, a means by which one's consciousness or torsion energy or bioenergy may enter or persist within once, once removed from the body. And that's the key. Now, our physical systems, uh, I should say sensory systems, only uh, perceive a discrete band of energy. We can only hear, for instance, from 20 to 20,000 hertz. We can only see a, a certain range of colors. We know, however, that energy exists, that yes. it's not perceivable beyond those ranges. Uh, we all understand that. Yes. The question is, is that a different reality? Uh, the radio frequencies in my the, our environment that we're being bombarded with, we can't see it, but and we can't experience, but it does exist. The same thing that people report when they have NDEs. You know, I'm experiencing another realm, but uh, again, we can't validate it. We can't objectively quantify it, only qualify it anecdotally based on one's uh, subjective expressions of their uh, essence of the unique experience that they have. And they're limited using terms uh, of our language that don't fully capture mm -hmm. what they are seeing. You know, when they say no time, no space. Eternity and now exist simultaneously. Yes, right. Uh, you know, subatomic particles behave that way. You, you divide a photon in half, you separate them by billions of light years, you manipulate one. Right, the other one, once bound, responds instantaneously uh, in, in the opposite manner. But the point is, there's this invisible pathway between once bound subatomic particles. Well, what does that mean for human beings? 
Does it have any implications for consciousness, for the afterlife? Uh, could it possibly be the foundation by which many of these things that we call paranormal, which I don't like the term, uh, but maybe it provides uh, the basis or explanation for unexplained, unusual events, which unfortunately too many people consider, as I hate to use this so-called term, woo-woo, Yes. Or, you know, not 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 you know not relevant or this individual was having this experience is probably having a dissociative type of uh, psychological aberration or or um, a schizotypal uh, pathology and and yeah certainly there are of course uh, individuals who do manifest those c- conditions and do uh, report some things that are somewhat similar to what we're talking about but what separates the millions who report NDEs and experiences with the so-called afterlife is that they're transformed in a positive way. And that's the key term, positive. The, those who are psychologically disordered um, don't have this positive behavioral transformation. It's not consistent with the psychopathology that they, that they have. But the key, too, is that the psychological community, as I mentioned earlier, must, must acknowledge that millions of people are confused by initially at least by their experience and they need adequate support and that's why many individuals speak you know listen to your shows for that needed support and i commend you greatly sandra for for bringing this to the attention of so many individuals who are yearning for an answer with fierce determination because they're very confused and they're mm-hmm. reluctant, of course, obviously, to share their experience with others. I, we know that. I remember when my book first came out, I people in my life besides my mom and my aunt didn't know that I was driven to write a book about the afterlife and grief and my take on what humanity is all about. The moment it came out, I was petrified what people would think of me if I were to share. And like you said, woo woo. I didn't want people to think I was one of those, you know, crazy people. And what happened to me, I just couldn't even believe. There has not been one person that I've met that hasn't said, Oh, isn't that interesting? You know, I've had this experience I've never told anyone, or I've always been interested in this, or let me tell you, uh, my dad had a near-death experience or or something. So I think there's fear involved with humanity of what, you know, we all want to be included and accepted. And, and so when I realized that from my own fear into where I am now, I thought if we could have an open dialogue, which is my show and getting involved in other organizations talking about these things, maybe it'll take some of the fear away. Because this is a common thread of all human beings, I think, is we question our mortality. What is our life for? Is there life after death? And just to not make it a taboo subject, but, you know, open up these conversations, no matter what you believe. Uh, indeed. Um, uh, well, well stated. The Unfortunately, it does have uh, a, a negative connotations. Uh, this, this arena is generally regarded as a pseudoscience by mainstream, a mainstream scientific community, which is yes. unfortunate. Uh, much, much more research is, is required. We spent how many? $15 billion uh, sponsoring the Hadrian Collider in search of the so-called God particle, which is important. But let's direct some of that uh, funding into areas of study that address the arena that we are focusing on today, which is which is the most intimate thing of human existence, uh, consciousness. Without consciousness, there is, of course, nothing. Uh, but why do these kinds of spiritual and mystical, well, mystical experiences trigger a change in the individual? Why does the, the individual realize that everything is connected? Now, as a result of their unique experience, they, they come to a realization that I find fascinating that they, they now believe they're both a physical and a spiritual being and that they are having a, a multi-dimensional like type of experience. And they say this, uh, they even use the terms a holographic reality, uh, at which is analogous to many theories in quantum physics uh, regarding the quantum hologram theory of consciousness. It's an integral part of many theories that are 
uh, that have emerged from uh, quantum physics or the study of subatomic particles. So uh, once, once I guess we can say so-called so spiritual eyes are opened by this extraordinary experience in many different ways, um, they feel, these individuals feel that they're exposed to other dimensions. And that perspective, it seems to predominate them uh, and transforms their uh, philosophical and personal viewpoints by that realization. And that realization may be the necessary prerequisite condition that seems to shift their perspectives to live life with more gratitude, more love, more trust, more empathy. And, and maybe that, you know, we're saying, why do they have these positive transformative changes? That, that's something that I, I'm trying to figure out. And, and what, what is causing that? Uh, and certainly the psychological community must look at this more seriously. And they don't. They do, simply do not. Uh, there's a new field of study called neurotheology, which attempts to bridge the scientific s spiritual gap, so to speak. Mm. In my in my next book, I'm trying trying to do just that as well as I tried to do in my my recent book on life after death. Yes. Uh, what you know, trying to figure out why these intense, awe-inspiring emotions incurred from different types of experiences give rise to similar psycho spiritual behavioral outcomes. You know, that's easy to say. It's it's another thing to, to prove it, to <laughs> demonstrate it. Definitely. And that's but that's where researchers need to go. Can we talk a little bit? I just um, want to brag about your book a bit because I'm actually on the contents page and you know we've spoken a about a few of these things touched on near death experiences, out of body experiences, the, con the quantum world, holographic concept, but you have certainly done your research things like apparitions and instrumental trance communication, um reincarnation, child prodigies, uh, the skull experiment, mediumship, ESP, um, so, so, so much. And I don't want to say you're one-stop shopping, but you really have done some research and you have one heck of a bibliography and Internet resources as well. Uh, so thank you for the work you've done. But can you touch on maybe one of these other things, maybe reincarnation or uh, instrumental transcommunication? As, um, yeah, maybe just well, something. Sure. <laughs> okay. Sure. Sure. Uh, psychiatrist Ian Stevenson did the most research um, uh, uh, in the area of reincarnation, uh, whereby it, he studied children, generally below the age of eight, who claimed to have recall of past lives. And he followed up with that detailed information uh, to either confirm or refute uh, their reported uh, uh, memory. Uh, of, of past life experiences, and he found that there was a unique um, relationship that showed that these kids were able to recall aspects of past lives, which the, the child's parents contended that the child could not have known. Uh, the question, of course, is whether or not that child, for instance, did indeed inhabit another body at another time, or as some people speculate, they were simply using ESP, um, yes. clairvoyance, or precognition, whatever you want to call it, uh, reading, in other words, the mind of living individuals who have that information. And, and we don't, we can't prove it. Uh, Ian Stevenson, based on that, uh, concluded that the evidence strongly suggests but doesn't prove that reincarnation is real. And he, in fact, he even thought that the evidence, the physical evidence, was even more compelling, whereby he noted uh, birthmarks or physical aberrations in the children that were consistent with the manner in which they died. In other words, uh, to take one case, a child uh, reported being uh, stabbed with a knife that went uh, in, in, into the area of the stomach and came out the back, and, and Stevenson noted that uh, within four inches of the described location on the body existed a birthmark at the entrance and also at the exit wound. Interesting. He, you know, he saw many of these kinds yes. of 
um, um, pieces of evidence that he thought was much more significant um, uh, than, again, the anecdotal uh, reports. Um, but here again, trying to connect, connect the dots in these different areas, which also incorporates, uh, as you mentioned, instrumentation of transcommunication. Uh, people try to uh, record, in other words, um, so-called discarnate entities uh, using uh, simple devices um, uh, that pick up radio frequencies and tune to certain frequencies people can tend to hear deceased individuals respond appropriately to their questions. I have a friend of mine, uh, Brent Rain is a, a noted uh, researcher in this area. Uh, he contends that he has been very successful in doing this, as many people do. Uh, of course, it's subject to controversy, criticism, debate. Uh, again, no firm conclusion can be made uh, regarding whether or not, indeed, the discarded entities can be objectively uh, uh, measured in the form of a voice recording, uh, or is the individual doing the recording projecting that onto the the, the, the device itself? It remains a, obviously a controversy. Uh, but experiments too um, uh, it, it, with ho ho holistic um, uh, hospice workers, that is, uh, and physicians of the critically of critically ill, they contend that it is highly Common for individuals who are transitioning from, from life to death to contend that they interact, communicate with deceased relatives, religious figures, angels, even with different colored wings. Yes. That's common in their minds. And studies have, have confirmed that to be the case. Uh, we see mediums, too, who uh, in experiments at the Winbridge Institute, uh, Julie Bichelle and colleagues have, have conducted many well-controlled experiments uh, quadruple blind experiments with um, uh, mediums who they contend, based on their analysis of the evidence, have an accuracy of, of recalling events remote from their body in which they contend could not have been obtained without the use of their sensory systems to be 80% and more accurate. And defying uh, odds of chance, uh, you know, million to one. Uh, so we see, not, I'm not telling people to walk into a, the corner store that has, you know, $25 for a psychic reading. You know, no. the vast majority of times you're going you're gonna to get nothing but the hindsight or insight uh, and, and not, right. not a true uh, valid individual who's capable of such abilities. There are some, however, and all, again, all you need is one who can do it to prove that the phenomena is indeed real. And I do believe that aspects of ESP, again, are real. We see this happening on many different levels and many different studies that have been replicated by independent researchers. You know, what part, maybe one of the most significant studies was the Global Consciousness Project at Princeton University. And, and very briefly, we have in this study that had, a, a, I believe it was 100 random event generators that emit zeros and ones in a random fashion. So over time, you're going to get 50% zeros and 50% ones, obviously. However, when major worldwide events occurred that drew the attention of millions worldwide collectively to focus on the event, these non-random generators, which, which sent the information of zeros and ones to a server at Princeton University for analysis, found the significantly deviate, deviation from randomness. They become non-random. Again, odds of ha happening by chance being you know, over a million to one sure. in that in that area. And it was time locked to the event. What event? Unfortunately, the the catastrophic event of 9/11. We see that that. Just as the plane hit one of the buildings, we see a spike or a significant deviation of these random event generators. And then it dissipates as the, the horror-filled event um, 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 is reduced, meaning the day has, has gone by, whereby on the next day, the randomness continued. We see this also during the tsunami of Southeast Asia, which killed hundreds of thousands yes. of individuals. Uh, even the president, uh, uh, election of President Obama, uh, Al Qaeda attacks, etc. The point is, 
what's going on. The consciousness, consciousness worldwide, focusing attention or intention to a single event somehow gives rise to this change in physical systems called psychokinesis. We see evidence of this in other ways as well. This is just a, a collective consciousness type of way. And it goes back to what Wigner and Schrodinger mentioned, the Nobel Prize recipients who say that there is a cosmic consciousness. Uh, ESP, you know, is, is a byproduct of that, which they claim, not me, Nobel Prize recipients yes. <laughs> claim this. You know, Nikola Tesla, you know, uh, on the order of uh, Albert Einstein said, you know, you know, science will make more progress once they begin studying the paranormal. Um, then, you know, cu using current traditional concepts and methodologies appropriate, you know, for that time when he was alive many, many decades ago. Well, he might be onto something, uh, and I'm not one to argue with him. Likewise, I'm not one to argue with Stephen Hawking, who contends that there are multiverses, that there are black holes, and on the envelope of these black holes contain information fields of everything that ever, of every event, every thought, everything that occurred. That's mind-boggling. You know, it's mind-boggling. You know, the point is, what I'm saying is not weird. Maybe it is to some, but listen to what Stephen Hawking said. Listen to what other noted physicists, not that they're right, but, you know, these contentions by people who are regarded to be the, 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 the most brilliant of all throughout uh, you know, recent history, at least, are, are talking about things that are even more, uh, what? I hate to use the term again, woo-woo, mm -hmm. than individuals who are claiming to you know, perceive other realities. Um, but it's on par with that. Yet p people will tend to listen to them, but not to the neighbor who says they saw a UFO or had an NDE. So, you know, w what's the fundamental goal? You know, we have to try to explore deeper levels of reality that that atoms and molecules, so using you know, using quantum and unified field theories, uh, suggest. We don't, however, apply it to the subjective experience that people are contending to have in, in trying to better understand this aspect of reality, not at a subatomic level, which is important, but are there parallels to be the behavior of the that to the behavior of or recall of one subjective experience that is so extraordinary in detail, capturing another type of reality where life is extraordinarily different, that, that in, encompasses altered aspects of perception and uh, of reality, of time and space, of, of emotional uh, of feelings that could never have been imagined beforehand. Uh, can we try to develop, if at all possible, a physical law that may help explain all of this? And I do not believe it's a byproduct of a dying chaotic brain in all instances, maybe some. Right. Uh, I, it's not a byproduct of the brain, but many people contend that it may be. And I can't dismiss that irrefutably. It may very well be. But we need the scientific community to try to explain consciousness as a byproduct of the brain or independent of the brain that persists after brain death. And maybe principles in quantum processes and non-local information, even the string theory, the unified field theory, other theories that are, exist in the present time that are being um, put forward, that are being analyzed, uh, maybe will someday find an answer to this most enigmatic question uh, that I believe exists at the present time and probably throughout time itself, ever since we wondered, am I the physical body? Am I a spiritual being mm -hmm. uh, living within a multidimensional reality once I leave the body? Uh, and maybe that's what people are experiencing when they have these OBEs, NDEs, a reality beyond, beyond the body's sensory or physical limitations uh, that we all have because we, we, we have you know, sensory systems, but we're limited by their inability to perceive all aspects of reality, which we do know exist in the form of acoustic, visual, among other types of energies. 
Yeah, I don't need to know how my cell phone works to know that it works. And even thinking of progress, years ago, many men were working on electricity and light. And thankfully for Thomas Edison and others after him, we don't even give it a second thought that we have light. Even I remember not only my first um, cell phone, how big and bulky that was, but my very first computer. And with enough people working on it, how progress has really changed. It's, you know, we have all of technology and everything we need to know right in the palm of our hand, and we take it for granted. But I think with an, and I love your book, I love all the um, things I found on you online, all your speaking and all that, because I think when we get young minds, even older minds that start questioning these things, it might spark something that, you know what, that's the field I want to go into. And in this whole world of consciousness, I don't know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, what could be possible? You know, what findings could happen? And then we'll remember this conversation back in 2018 and say, wow, look at look at where it's gone from here. So I think we're, uh, we have a great potential. And I really thank you for doing so much work in, in what you're doing um, right now and in the past, because it'll help generations to come i feel uh, i appreciate uh, i appreciate your comments it's very kind of you and and uh i i certainly agree with your general concept uh which i guess relates to curiosity and that is a necessary prerequisite we need to be curious about life death and other aspects of what we can't explain uh, to better understand the nature of reality, possibly. And as long as we are curious-minded, um, we can ask the right questions in order to get the appropriate answers to questions that millions of people uh, yearn for an answer to. Excellent. Are there any questions I should be asking you at this point that I haven't? There's something you want to share that you're passionate about or... Um, I don't know where to go from now. I'm just sitting here like, wow. <laughs> I, 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 would, I would suggest um, that members of, of, of your audience uh, who are, I believe, for the most part, very spiritual individuals, um, many who are seeking um, answers in varying ways based on their own unique experiences, but are just, or just curious-minded um, uh, in this regard. I commend you all. Uh, very much um, and I, I encourage you to continue reading not, not only my book but all book, you know all books out there on varying topics that touch upon some of the things we're discussing and make up your own mind about what it all means I, in, in, I attempted in my book to be objective I'm not saying there is or is not an afterlife but I, I'm trying to connect the dots to provide a more comprehensive uh, picture so the reader can make up his or her own mind or be better informed in which to do so. Uh, but be objective. That's obviously critical and easier said than done in all aspects of life. We all, however, manage to have these errors in inductive reasoning. You know, we, In other words, we we agree with things that are consistent with our beliefs or disagree with things that are not, uh, that are inconsistent with our beliefs. And, and we all fall into that trap. Um, and, and talking about these uh, highly controversial issues uh, results in us losing objectivity oftentimes and reading information that is highly or poorly uh expressed or poorly researched or misleading uh, in varying ways, yet many people do, do um, agree with it because they want it to be true. Uh, so be careful what you read and who you listen to. Uh, there's a lot of sense and nonsense out there, and, it's, and, and separating fact from fiction is certainly a, a difficult challenge for all of us, uh, certainly me included. And that's why my book was uh, uh, difficult to to put together because I had to along the way try to establish the validity of of the experiments to incorporate what I thought was most meaningful um, to 
to support or reject a, a certain hypothesis that, that I, I uh, consider in my book. Um, it's just one step in a long process. And uh, unfortunately, I will likely not be in this body when we ultimately have, have a firm conclusion about what we are talking about, whether or not there is an afterlife or a torsion energy, uh, etc. Uh, but, you know, maybe Dr. Edgar Mitchell, um, who on his return trip back from the moon, when he observed Earth, and we can only, only speculate at best what it might, must feel like to literally observe the Earth while walking on the moon or traveling in space. But many of these astronauts have what they call an overview effect or a profound reaction to viewing the planet from outside its atmosphere. And many astronauts like Mitchell, they attribute that experience to transform them, that feeling of awe, uh, that unity with nature, they call it a universal brotherhood, uh, self-transcendence, uh, so to speak. They, they, they call it an explosion of awareness. I believe Mitchell called it an overwhelming sense of oneness and connectedness. He, he considered it an epiphany. That epiphany is what people have when they have NDEs, uh, and it that why it is transformative, but it's transformative in many different ways, seeing Earth from space or having an NDE or other types of extraordinary and different experiences. But that led Edgar Mitchell to develop the Institute for Noetic Sciences, which is a think tank in the area of consciousness studies. Um, he knew, he knew that there was something, quote unquote, well beyond current day scientific knowledge that must deserve additional attention from a research perspective uh, in order to better understand the meaning and essence of what life is all about. Mm, I have one last question for you. Speaking of transformation, ha do you feel that your journey, your life has been enhanced or transformed or changed in any way by you delving into these questions of extraterrestrial trials, life after death, uh, consciousness, personally? Um, good question. Um, yes and no. Um, it's made me more obsessive in terms of doing research, writing, lecturing, doing radio shows, indeed. Uh, I focus maybe too much attention in this arena as a result of this passion I have. Um, and yeah, I probably spend, if I may say, too less time with my wife <laughs> uh, as a result of that, a a admittedly. But I do feel, however, uh, driven from within and maybe from out, whatever that might mean. I do feel a unique burning desire to f try to connect those dots to make sense of existing research which again, we do not have scientific principles to adequately apply to understand what we're talking about here. But nevertheless, since it's 2018, I'm trying to use present day concepts, experiments to do so. You know, I wish it was 100 years from now, it would be a, probably a much easier task to do so. <laughs> yeah, we'd be uh, laughing but, that we were struggling way back when. Uh, but yeah, I, so my answer oh, is yes yeah, and no. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. And I believe that what you're doing with all your speaking and research is you're planting seeds. And then there are those who are listening and watching and viewing and reading that will nurture them and that will, you know, help have these questions be answered in the future. So, uh, Dr. Robert Davis, I want to thank you for being our guest today. I appreciate it very much. And, and my website is bobdavisspeaks.com. Yes. bobdavisspeaks.com. And my new book on life after death and analysis of the evidence is certainly available. And um, I hope those who may purchase it will, will think. And that's my main objective. I want to make people think and possibly in the process provide needed support for those who are seeking an answer. Not that I have an answer, but I, I do hope they find more additional information to help them on their unique journey. And our journeys are individual, and those questions lead to transformation. I don't think anybody 
can tell you that the stove is hot <laughs> without you putting your hand on the stove and realizing it is. You know, this is, and I just think this is our journeys as human beings. So I really want to thank you again for being our guest. Uh, remind our listener that our home base is we don't die radio.com. And now we have 238 fabulous episodes that will, I believe, open your mind and give you more questions. <laughs> if you'd like to meet me in person, I will be um, at Banyan Retreat in the UK, March 29th through April 2nd as an attendee at something called Whispers from the Soul. You can go to BanyanRetreat.com. There's an Afterlife Symposium coming up September 14th through 16th in Scottsdale, Arizona. Even if you can't make it, you can find out some of the cutting edge things that are happening with um, discovering consciousness, connecting through the veil into the afterlife. Uh, it's all kinds of things. Afterlifesymposium.org can start you finding out more. But in closing, my name is Sandra Sham plane and I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio and I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So ask questions, follow your heart to what sounds interesting to you, pick up a copy of Life After Death, an analysis of the evidence by Dr. Robert Davis. It sure is good. Uh, Bob Davis Speaks dot com or his other website, theufophenomena.com. I want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon.